Welcome to Melted. Frankie Melted Chapsticks, Hollywood of the Melted Chapsticks, your host today. Boston Free Radio. Melted is on Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock. I have John Jeffrey on today from Kiss This, Western New York. He put together a Kiss tribute album like no other. Amazing. With a whole lot of superstars that we're going to talk about for a good cause. Compass House and the Homeless. Very thoughtful. I am really looking forward to hearing about the production of the album. You can get it on Bandcamp. I got my copy. It's great music from stars from Alice Cooper to the Goo Goo Dolls to the Talisman. Some of my favorites. So we're really excited to talk music. Really get to know about the project. John has also interviewed all the members of KISS. We're going to talk about that and his experience. As well as one of my favorites, Phil Schaus of the Talisman and Accept. We are sponsored by Carlino Guitars, the hottest brand in the land. He makes guitars, leather straps, picks, anything a band would need. If you go to Carlino Guitars, 135 Mystic Ave in Medford. He's open Sunday, 11 to 7, Monday through Friday, 11 to 9, Saturday, 10 to 7. He has thousands of guitars in there shirts for your band the merch he made a nice rhinestone guitar for me he works for kiss slash cheap trick you name it he's done it he has a nice purple couch where you'll find jimmy and danny sitting there if you need some musical therapy you'll also see budding star ava patrillo and you can get wonderful guitar lessons from joe filoni incredible teacher even better person and a lot of fun encourage you to get down there grab a guitar Eddie's always there with a smile. Say Frankie sent you and he'll double the price. Really excited to talk about this project, Buffalo Rock City, what went into it, how it came about, how it helps the homeless, and just looking at what people are doing during the pandemic. Guess this has been busy making an album, which is wonderful. Also want to talk about how they did it, how they got everyone together to make such a large project happen. Uh, it was, And here we have on the line, John Jeffrey from Kiss This. How are you, brother? Good. How are you, Frankie? You know what? No complaints, and I'm not going to complain about snow because I know... The magical city of Buffalo invented it. <laughs> you know exactly. Might, might as well have. I know. Uh, might want to give better uh, props to Canada because they're pretty icy up there. Yeah, and they do they have. You're pretty close to the casinos up there, aren't you? Yeah, um, actually, uh, Buffalo is about uh, 30 minutes from Niagara Falls, New York, and uh, there's uh, casinos there, and then right across the. Uh, Right across the bridge, then there's Niagara Falls, Ontario, and they have uh, they have casinos up there as well. We're going to roll the dice today. I'm so glad that you joined me, and you have done quite a bit. I just want to kind of ask you a few questions first. Yeah, you are a ahead, man. whatever whatever you want, man. That there's a lot of a lot of history. Um, I've done you know working for Kiss since I was a teenager. Um, I helped uh, the Eric Carr family when uh, they wanted to uh, have KISS do a a benefit for Eric Carr, which ultimately they didn't wind up doing, but um, it was a pretty interesting uh, process to be involved with. I helped Eric Singer do his very first KISS Fan Expo after he left the band in 96. Um, You know, uh, I've done uh, this a tribute band that I'm in, um, going back on and off to about uh, 2000, and then um, about 2014 is when uh, really the whole, I guess, the whole idea of doing this tribute record started, and that's kind of led everything up until now. So, uh, yeah, I got quite a bit to talk about, so mm-hmm. whatever you want to ask. I'm- Thank you so much. How long does it take to, to put the ace makeup on? It takes um, just over two hours to do it. Wow. I've done it twice for Halloween, but, you know, you're you're in the band. So I saw a photo. How many, was that a Kiss Cruise that you were on? No, I've never been on a Kiss Cruise, actually. I've, uh, it was something, you know, I'm not a fan of 
of boats. <laughs> <laughs> Although you and walk on water. Yeah, if I could, I would walk on water. Um, yeah, you know, um, no, I've never been a fan of boats. Um, although seeing how the Kiss Cruise has, has taken off and, and what a great event it's turned into, um, I do have to admit as a fan, it seems like some of the 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 things that they did when they first started doing the cruises, they kind of stopped doing uh, on these last few cruises, which is a bit of a disappointment. But um, for the most part, overall, the Kiss Cruises seem to, you know, be a really great thing for, for diehards, especially, you know, getting to hear all the, the rare tracks that they play on the cruises that they don't normally do live. That That's the biggest thing that, uh, you know, when footage starts to surface uh, after the cruises that I like to see is the, the rare material that they play live. The deep cuts. Yes. Now there's a picture of you with Gene Paul Stanley. Where was okay. that taken? I don't know what particular picture you're <laughs> There was one on your uh, Facebook page, uh, and it seemed like okay. there's two KISS groups and one of the demons has his tongue sticking out near Gene. Gene's oh, trying not to laugh. Yeah, yeah. That's actually um, when Kiss played Darien Lake um, in 2019. Um, I had the opportunity, thanks to uh, Keith LaRue and, and Doc McGee, um, the radio station here in Buffalo, 97 Rock, they wanted us to um, kind of... Uh, do a like, sort of like a fan appreciation thing because obviously you know not everybody gets their photo taken with kiss and you know for a lot of people you know uh when you know when they come to a concert and they can get their photo taken with us it's you know it's, it's probably the closest thing that a lot of people can do unless they're willing to pay the the money in order to do so so 97 rock had us meeting the fans that were coming into the concert and taking photos with them and um i you know from doing work with kiss like i said since i was a teenager i have known keith and i've known doc and um they actually made it happen where my band was able to go backstage and we were able to get our photo of uh, taken with um you know kiss this taken a photo with the actual kiss so that's that's what that was from what a what a real thrill and going back to your interviewing days what magazine right. was it and it, you got to interview all the members past yes, present yes yes um it was it was called the kiss underground i seven years old i started my own kiss fan magazine called the kiss underground and basically that started from a desire of being a young kiss fan wanting to meet my idols and before the internet and before you know google and so forth you know in order to get uh, a phone number you basically had to call what they called it was information and you call the information line and you would ask for a phone number you know in any city or state or country and if there was one listed they would give it to you so when i was a kid I asked for the number for the KISS offices, and I gave the address that they had listed inside of, you know, the albums that when you'd buy the albums, you'd see, you know, KISS offices, uh, Glickman, Marks, New York, New York, and, you know, would have the street address. And I gave that to the information line, and they actually gave me a phone number for the KISS offices. And I called them, and I'm like, hey, I'm a fan what do I have to do to meet KISS? And they're like, well, KISS really only talks to people who work in the press. And I'm like, so if I worked for a magazine, KISS would talk to me? And they said yes. So uh, kind of a light bulb went off in my head, and I'm like, well, what if I started my own KISS magazine? Uh, because back at the time, this was like 85, 86, it was um, really the only way that you could get information about KISS at that time 
would be going and uh, going to the supermarket and picking up uh, the latest issue of Hit Parade or, or Circus or Metal Edge magazine. And there usually would only be like a kind of a small blurb about the band, not too much information. Sometimes there'd be a full, you know, article, but a lot of times there are just small blurbs about the band. And, you know, magazine were periodicals and they would only come out, you know, every so often. So you'd be waiting month to month just to get some new tidbit about what KISS was doing. So kind of my idea was to have a, a magazine that was nothing but information about KISS. And um, I actually reached out to some other uh, KISS fan clubs that were active at the time, and one of them was called the KISS Force. And KISS Force was run by Keith LaRue and David Snowden. Uh, David Snowden actually went on to work for Vinnie Vincent uh, when Vinnie Vincent Invasion started in 85. And as we know, Keith LaRue has been working for KISS and doing KISS Online now for a number of years. But um, that was one of the um, fan clubs that was around at the time that actually they gave me a lot of information as far as what I needed to do to get started and put me in touch with some different photographers to get, you know, um, exclusive photos and um you know and basically how to reach out to the band and to get information and so i started my own uh at first it started out as a newsletter it was a eight page newsletter that expanded to a, a full you know uh fan magazine and um you know doing that once i got that started you know, I started sending copies to the KISS offices, and they would send copies to the band. And then I finally um, was able to do my first interview with Eric Carr in 1986. And, um, you know, that that was great experience. And ever since then, I, I did the KISS Underground from 1987 was when the first issue was released and from 1987 to 2007 I ran the Kiss Underground and um, throughout that time I had the opportunity to interview everybody who's ever been a member of Kiss uh, past and present so that was uh, that was a, a very um, I was very a very good opportunity as a fan you know to be able to really get to know the, the workings of the band and the different members and their personalities and and quirks and everything and and kind of see how the whole thing you know is from the outside and from the inside well you're brilliant it's all about visualization and believing and being prepared and but you made it happen just like the tribute album, Buffalo Rock City, which we're going to get into. As far as going down the list of members of KISS that you've interviewed, how would you rank them from the most open? Like, who was the most open? I would have to say the most open would be Eric Singer. Um, he, would all, he is the type of guy that would not shy away from any question. I mean, he would answer it directly. Um, you know, and and if it was something that he didn't want to, like, really get into, like, as far as, like, really discuss, he would be straight up about that, too. But he would be honest about it. Um, Gene and Paul are the king of spinning, you know, questions. Uh, if you ask them a question that they don't like to answer, they will be able to turn around your question and answer it in another way that you think you got an answer, but you, they didn't even really answer your question. Well, we're going to um, vote them into office. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Pol the politicians of rock and roll. But no, the, you know, honestly, both those guys, during all the interviews I did with them over the years, they're always really nice to me and very respectful. Even when I interviewed them, you know, the earlier years, again, when I was just a, you know, a teenager in my early 20s, you know, it was obvious by, you know, my voice was a lot higher back then, and you know, and, and I was sometimes nervous, and, um, you know, they could, I'm sure, pick up on that, and they were still very respectful, and, you know, and they were awesome in answering my questions. Um, you know, as far as anybody being 
closed off as far as questioning, I would probably say Vinnie Vincent was probably, you know, like if you asked him questions that he didn't want to answer, um, you know, like, like most of my interviews that I did with Vinny were actually um, through uh, email correspondence, or not email, rather, through uh, fan mail, actually, mm-hmm. back then. And so you would, you know, type out your questions, and then if Vinny didn't want to answer the question, he would put an X through it, or there just wouldn't be anything filled in in uh, the, the spaces where you ask the questions. So I would say as far as most guarded, I would have to say Vinny. Was Ace the most fun? I would have to say no, because Ace, Ace is the worst when it comes, I think, uh, as far as a, 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 a fan performer interaction. Like, if you know Ace, or if Ace knows you, you can have amazing conversations with the guy. But if you're, like, a member of, like, the press, or if Ace doesn't know you, um, he's not very personable. And... I just think that's his personality. He just doesn't open up to strangers in the way where, you know, say you go to a KISS meet and greet, uh, you know, the KISS guys will act like they've known you, even if they just met you for the first time, they'll act like they've known you, like your their whole lives or your whole lives. And they're like, hey, how you, you know, Ace is very, you know, like, I don't know if guarded is the correct word, but he's just... I would just say Ace is not very personable unless he really knows you. So those, like, fan interactions or even, you know, uh, like, press-type interviews, um, he's not very personable. Um, I've seen Ace do more current interviews now since he's been sober, and he seems a lot more open and a lot more jovial and happy during those interviews. But, I, you know, to be honest, like, when I interviewed Ace, he was just very, um, just just very direct. You know, he asked a question, they give you an answer. That's it. Next question, answer. He he wouldn't go into a lot of detail or depth with the answer. Just kind of give you a, you know. And, and Gene Simmons has been like that too. I've I've had interviews with Gene where Gene would literally give me yes or no answers, and I could go through 50 questions and be done in 15 minutes. I've had other inter- interviews with Gene where he's been on the phone with me for an hour, and he would go into, you know, real lengthy answers. So, you know, it, it also depends on the situation, I guess, too. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I have been sober just celebrating 10 years without alcohol right before New Year's, and I think you're dealing with Probably in any band you've been in, you're dealing with different personalities. Correct. I don't take one interaction as that's the person. You've seen it over the years, and you catch people on a bad day or a good day, and and that's just what it is. But I think it's really exciting that you've had that experience to interview all of them. I saw Kiss and Motley Crue, Creatures of the Night, Mm -hmm. Cow Palace. San Francisco, early 80s. And I get there, and I wasn't quite aware. I was like, who is this Ankh character? <laughs> Where did Ace go? <laughs> and, uh, he probably didn't even know what it, what it was on his face. We know now. Yeah. Right? Like, you just see some gold cross or something on it. You know, like, you're like, what? What? You know, who? You know, I remember when I first seen a picture of... Uh, it was in 16 magazine it was a great concert yet still but i was just being at that age and without the age of the internet and thankfully you know you had your magazine distribution nowadays is really instant with people leaving the band or you know coming back and forth you're really like what's going on here it was a really killer show with the turret of the tank moving and totally amazing I yeah, and, and I just wanted to add that um, just on what you had said as far as um, instantaneous information, that's what's actually led to me stop stopping 
publishing the Kiss Underground is because one of the things that I always kind of prided myself with with the fanzine was having a news section. And the problem was was that once the Internet hit, you know, even though my publishing time wasn't as behind as like an actual, you know, uh, magazine where where their lead time is so far off from the time when their magazine actually hits the stands you know mine was still a couple months off from when sometimes news would hit and you know people would be able to literally just go you know on on a kiss you know whether it be kiss online or kiss asylum was one of the big news sites at the time and um you know people would just be able to get the information instantaneously and by the time they got you know, my fan magazine, you know, my information was old. I, I have to say the thing I prided myself most with was every issue that I published had an exclusive interview with one of the members of the band, which, you know, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, something that, that every other, you know, newsletter or fan club um, can say that they did, but I, I did. And um, so, I mean, that, that was something that, that I, you know, pride myself with that I was able to do that in every issue was have an exclusive interview. Um, but I, again, when it came to the news, that's what ultimately made me come to the decision of, you know, stop publishing the, the uh, ad- actual physical, you know, newsletter or fanzine um, was just, again, the, the Internet and everything being so, so instantaneous. That was – no, I did. I Actually, I did. I, I went – in 2003, 2003 was actually the last issue that I printed of the Kiss Underground, and then from 2003 to 2007, I um, I ran the website, and then unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, I I really don't know. I think I think this was around the time that Keith had just taken over um, for Kiss Online. And they were really trying to revamp the whole KISS online experience. And what was happening was that a lot of events that I was trying to cover for the, the website, um, I was told by management that they were KISS online exclusives, and I wasn't able to get access to them. So I kind of felt in a way that um, – management was kind of pushing anything that was unofficial kind of to the wayside as far as coverage. So I felt if I can't cover these events that are happening and provide some sort of, you know, exclusive coverage, like I didn't find any, any, uh, it didn't seem uh, advantageous for me to just, you know, take something that's already posted on kiss online and post it on the KISS Underground website. You know, I wanted to have my own exclusive content like how I did in the, in the fan magazine. Um, so the fact that I wasn't able to, you know, gain access to those exclusive events, I just had to come to the decision basically, well, if they want their only outlet to be their official KISS Online website, then so be it. And in 2007, that's, that's when it ended the KISS Underground. Well, I have to hand it to you, your initiative to even do this as a fan. I know later in Thank life, you. really, I, I just want to congratulate you. I Thank you. I really feel, even in my own case, I didn't pick up an instrument until much later in life. I started a band, The Melted Chapsticks, which is a mix of originals, covers, punk music, as my mother said, when are you going to go back to playing guitar? You really can't sing. But that was my vision. And I started with the bass guitar because it only had four strings. And then we end up playing a St. Patrick's Day Parade, a few of them, and still having fun in the city. So it's just a testimony to you as a teenager saying, look, I like this. And to go out there and do it, you can do anything including, you're in your own tribute band, including, I saw a really nice interview on an AM Buffalo station with your bandmate, who's Gene Taylor Sturza. I hope I get his name right. Yeah, no, that's, you, you got it exactly right. 
I just want to talk about Buffalo Rock City. Now, there's several things about it. It's on Bandcamp. I have my copy. A lot of songs that I know, some deep cuts as well. You produced it with another gentleman. What's his name? I really couldn't pronounce his last name. Oh, oh Joe, Joe Teresi. Joe Thank Teresi. you. Yes. He, I mean, and really, it was, you know, Joe is listed as co producer, but it was really a combined effort between myself, Joe, Sean Prisblack, uh, Jody Valletta, and Gene Schmidt. Um, Joe and I, we were like the initial, uh, I guess the initial core behind the whole figuring out how we were going to go about recording the album and figuring that out. And then throughout the process um, of recording, um, you know, Sean Prisblack got involved and he played drums on majority of the record. And Gene Schmidt, um, he also came in um, initially just to play guitar on a couple tracks, and we wound up doing a multitude of recording at his studio. So, you know, it, it's interesting how roles kind of changed and increased throughout the, you know, uh, creation of the album. Um, but, um, yeah, so it was really a combined effort between all of us um, with the vision and ultimately, you know, uh, you know, the going through and, 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 you know, producing the album and, um, you know, the, the final, the final, uh, you know, product. Now you're saying the conception, you had this conception in 2014. Is that correct? correct. Yes. And then to make it happen, tell me how you continued interviewing for some magazines, correct? Yes. Um, not for a magazine per se, but I actually, um, I once I stopped doing the Kiss Underground in 2007, I kind of took a break from doing anything as far as uh, I guess from a journalistic um, aspect. Um, but then I started actually working for uh, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Orwat, and he runs a website called Rock Music Star. And um, Tom had asked me if I would be interested in, in doing, you know, the KISS-related stuff for the site, because, you know, as he, he had known, I had a little bit of experience with that. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I said, sure. And so, you know, I would do a lot of, you know, the KISS interviews, and, uh, you know, when they would, you know, come to the area, I would do the concert reviews and some of the photography and, um, you know, CD reviews and so forth. So, you know, I, I was doing that. Um, and um, So a nice you know, interview with you and Phil Shouse, so who I interviewed a few weeks ago. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and that actually um, is, is, I guess you'd say, a segue of, how I got to know Phil and ultimately wound up having him and the rest of the talisman appear on the record was actually through, um, through interviewing him because, you know, I think when you, when you talk to people, you kind of can really, you know, I guess at least for me, when, you, when I interview people, I can really, kind of gauge what kind of person they are and I could really tell talking to Phil that he's a very genuine type person and uh, again he, he was somebody who he didn't shy away from it you know any questions and um, you know and, and I and I gotta you know give a tip to the hat that people are like that because you know some some people for whatever reason that they're guarded some people you know they're just you know an open book and Phil was an open book, and, and he was just very, uh, you know, generous, uh, you know, with all the information that he gave. And, you know, and we kept in contact after doing the interview. And actually, at the time, what wound up happening was that um, the first part of the interview that I did with him was actually when he was in the Gene Simmons band. And when Gene did his solo tour, um, for people out there, if they don't know, was that when he did his solo tours, there was a couple of times during the night that he would have fans come up on stage. Yes, I was at they, one of those shows, yes. 
Yeah, and for Do You Love Me, he would have uh, female attendees come out and come up on stage and sing backgrounds. And for I Love It Loud, he would have male fans come up for I Love It Loud. And um, Phil made it possible for Taylor and myself to come out on stage in full makeup and costume and sing I Love It Loud with Gene Simmons and the band and some other fans, uh, which was actually the last night of the uh, his solo tour in Verona, New York in 2018. Um, and then shortly after, Phil wound up, you know, his whole band, I should say, they went from transitioning from being the Gene Simmons band to being the Ace Freely band. So um, I kind of put the interview on hold because now this new information came to light that now the Gene Simmons band is now the Ace Freely band. So what we wound up doing is we wound up doing a second part of the interview once they became the Ace Freely band. So that way it kind of gave an interesting, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's ever been uh, done before where, where there was, you know, somebody who was a member of, you know, one member's solo band and then they just completely became another member's solo band that, that happened with Gene and Ace. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And um, so I wanted to have that, you know, included into the interview. No, that's a, an incredible story for the three of them to be able to... Yeah. You know, lifelong fans, you look up to these people, including yourself, to be able to be involved with such great music and pageantry, which is so exciting. I really, I love it. How did you get Jameson involved? Um, well, just like everybody who I got involved in the record, as far as people who, um, you know, uh, have... Uh, recording, you know, history or, you know, touring history on, on a national level, you know, I basically reached out to them and told them, you know, I wanted to do this record, Buffalo Rock City, and I wanted to do it, um, you know, w with, with a cause, for a cause, and I wanted to be able to, you know, pay it forward and really try to help, uh, you know, I, I, I guess you'd say, um, I don't even know how to, how to phrase it, honestly. I, I don't want to say a passion. I don't know if that's the correct word, but I, I guess a cause that has always kind of, um, you know, really resonated with me is, is the homeless situation. Um, you know, I, I've, I've always... Um, noticed and, 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 you know, no, no political affiliation either way, but just growing up, I've always noticed that, you know, the United States government has always gotten involved, kind of big brother, these other countries, and we've gotten involved with all these other, you know, uh, you know, conflicts. We'd go in, we'd help these other countries, you know, blow up these areas and, and you know, <laughs> knock them to the ground. And then we're like sending millions of dollars of aid to these same areas to help rebuild these places that we help destroy. And, at, you know, in the same token, we have people in the United States that still don't have food, that they don't have a place to live. They don't have shelter. They're not being taken care of. And the fact that we go and we get involved in, in these other situations so frequently it's just something I was like, man, I just it just it just blows my mind that that's something that still goes on to this day. And, and that's uh, why you you chose the Compass House. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, really, um, when it comes to the homeless situation, you know, um, the people that are most vulnerable and and the true victims, I think, are the kids because they're not the ones that are making necessarily, you know, some of the poor decisions that may be made by their parents that put them in those positions, or if they're kids that are coming from situations of abuse, um, you know, they're not responsible for those situations. They're, they're just, a, you know, a byproduct of it. And, and, you know, it's a circumstance that, you know, they're trying to escape. And that's what the Compass House does is they help out the, the kids, the, the homeless youth. So I felt, you know, if there was any organization that I could really do something for, you know, after doing some research, 
Compass House just seemed like the perfect um, organization to, to team up with to try to, to do some work for, to try to pay it forward to and, and to help. Yeah, I mean, I, that's the thing, that the stats that people miss out on, that a billion people won't eat today. And look, we're all going through our stuff, Yeah. let alone a pandemic, let alone the isolation, which I felt myself, where I'm so grateful now I can finally learn the beautiful guitar that Eddie Carlene made for me a few years ago, a little Paul Stanley model. The reality is you have the empathy and the foresight to help. And that's your karma, and that's going to come back to you as well. And it seems like, you know, with your vision of Kiss Magazine coming to life and being very successful, and then getting the right players involved, producing a wonderful album, it's just, it's it's a great buy-in and a reason to do it. The thing is, I think, growing up as well, especially you have evangelicals, et cetera, rock and roll people with long hair. It's it, Don't judge the book by the cover. People are beautiful if they're going to be beautiful, no matter how they look. You have plenty of Wall Street types that may be generous or not be generous. It's the individual. So I even remember, and I was going to ask you this too, which I think sure. it's so ridiculous, but I remember... Oh my God, don't listen to Kiss. Knights in Satan's service. Oh my God, stay away. <laughs> it's like, we're just trying to have a good time. You could also use the acronym, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. It's I agree. <laughs> I agree. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's, I, I, you know, I mean, if, you could really go down the rabbit hole in terms of like going through all like the different, you know, um, religious, uh, you know, traps of, you know, why, you know, some people may believe what, you know, Kiss is doing or what they're talking about, you know, um, you know, why they think it's evil or, or whatnot. But, you know, I mean, really, from most of the people that I know who have been KISS fans, they've all, because of their KISS fandom, they've done a lot of positive things in their life. And that's what you really have to, to look at, I think, in in the end result. I mean, if if you looked at, you know, as a whole, if, you, if you've if seen all these horror stories about people who are KISS fans that, um, you know, d- did, you know, horrible you know, uh, malicious things and, 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 you know, rampant suicides and all types of, types of things of that nature, I think you might say, well, maybe they might have a point. But, I mean, I, you know, I, there's so many different people that use KISS. Um, example, the, the wrestler, Dale Torborg, um, he was a guy who, you know, used KISS as a, uh, as a positive um, thing to, to help kind of uh, steer his career in the direction that he went into. He was a minor league uh, baseball player that got hit with a fastball and it basically ended his career and he he used, you know, the the um, you know, the positive messages of, you know, that are in a lot of the Kiss songs to help him, you know, basically try to redefine what he wanted to do um, you know, career-wise that led him uh, eventually into professional wrestling that led him to eventually being, you know, Kiss's chosen, uh, you know, uh, professional wrestler. Although that whole thing didn't necessarily work out in, in the way that it could have. Um, I think, you know, uh, Dale still looks at that whole process as being a very positive thing and using, you know, Kiss's positive message as an antithesis of what got him to where he wanted to be you know, I, I think that that speaks volumes. And again, like you were talking about what, what I did with the Kiss Underground and with this album, it, you know, I really didn't understand what it is. And, and after talking to some people, they basically told me it, it's, it's a form of manifestation, you know, believing that you can do something and not really letting anything stop you do it and, and, and just making it happen. And that's, I guess, the simple explanation of manifestation, and that's basically what I've done 
with the Kiss Underground and and with with this record, you know. Yeah, Buffalo Rock City, thirteen songs. If you were to go through them, you know, you have folks from Alice Cooper, Talisman, Goo Goo Dolls. Was that just more networking? And then how did you do the part and put it all together? I guess to, to go in the right order, I guess we'd have to go back to the beginning. It was in 2014. It was uh, My band Kiss This was playing in a place called the Hard Rock Cafe in Niagara Falls, New York, like we were talking about before. And um, uh, the guy who was actually booking bands at the time was a longtime friend of mine, Jody Valletta, who's actually one of the producers of the record, and he actually sings on several of the tracks. He's in a band called Dew Driver. Um, they do Jungle, and Jody also sings on I've Had Enough and uh, a few other songs he provided vocals for. Um, and Jody was uh, the booking agent at the club, and at the end of the night, um, we were talking about all the great Kiss songs that you know Kiss never gets to do live and like we were talking about before um with the kiss cruise you know um you know kiss on the cruise they get that opportunity because they're really playing to a a real rampant group of diehards but when they're playing to uh you know an arena of fans they're playing to a a cross-section of diehard kiss fans and casual you know just you know the plus ones the girlfriends the people that got dragged along to go that maybe they're not diehard kiss fans but they're music fans you know they want to see you know motley crew the month before and then they're gonna go see you know uh you know whatever hard rock band is is playing after kiss you know they're gonna go see them um you know so it was the you know conversation that really led to yeah, it's 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 unfortunate that when Kiss plays live, they kind of stick to a, a, a somewhat of a safe uh, set list when there's so many great songs that Acrobat they, is one of my favorites. Yeah, right. I mean, I yeah. wish they would jam on that, but like you're right, they just yeah, because it, you know the problem is 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 as much as you know you and I know the song Acrobat and know that Acrobat was the original version of Love Theme from Kiss. There's probably so many people out there if they started playing Love Theme from Kiss, they wouldn't even know what the heck they were playing. <laughs> right. You know? They would just look confused. Like, oh, Kiss has an instrumental? Well, yeah, they actually have a few of them, but, you know, like most casual fans don't even know that. You know, so that was the thing, you know, is we wanted to, to really, um, you know, have the ability to to go and have some fun and just we we're just you know Jody and I were just talking about wouldn't it be great if we got all of our Kiss fans in the area in Western New York to get together and do like a big Kiss jam and then that conversation led to well if we're going to do this big epic jam and play all these cool songs that Kiss never plays we got to record it then that conversation went to well if we're going to record it I guess we're going to book some studio time. So that was kind of led to the creation of Buffalo Rock City. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that doing this record, that we didn't follow the missteps of literally every other Kiss tribute record that's come out is is a compilation record. And we didn't want to do that because compilation records literally – they sound like you have 10 different bands that recorded in 10 different studios. They recorded their tracks. They were mixed, sent in, and just all put together on one release. And, and it's really a lot of those, the, the, the difference in recording quality and the, the sonic continuity is just not there. The passion's there. The love for Kiss is there. And sometimes the playing is better and sometimes it's not. But, you know, ultimately those compilation records, I think, really suffer sonically. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to record a Kiss tribute album that was like no other album. And we recorded it in the same way that a band, like an actual band would record an album, where we recorded all the drums first, 
were recorded in the same studio, same day, same drum set, all the drums to all the songs. So everything that we added on top of each song, it was just building upon the same foundation. So the drums created the sonic uh, concrete, the sonic foundation that, that connected each song to the next. And that was the way that we started the recording process. And then when I reached out to, you know, guys like Tommy Hendrickson from Alice Cooper, and like we had mentioned before, the Talisman and Robbie Takak, you know, basically um, it was all done through remote recording where they went to their studios of choice, they recorded their parts, and then we had everything uh, sent into us and this is where Joe Teresi comes in. Joe Teresi in Rochester, New York, he was like our home base studio. And Joe would meticulously go through all these tracks that were coming from all over the world, and he would comb through them. He would get rid of any mistakes, any little pops or cracks, or you know, anything that you don't want to hear on a recording. He would make sure it weren't there. If there was timing issues, he would fix them. So Joe really did a great job in terms of, you know, combing through all the tracks. And then once we had everything done, everything was sent to um, a gentleman named Broad Lockhart. And he works actually for Robbie Takak at his studio here in Buffalo called GCR Studios. And then all those tracks were sent to Brad, and Brad mixed the record. And then once it was mixed... I reached out to Jay Messina, and I told him, you know, what we were doing as far as, you know, this tribute album and the, and the cause behind it. And, you know, Jay totally believed in the same vision that I had in terms of making a great-sounding Kiss record and also the cause behind it. He believed in it 100%. So that's how Jay got on board. So sorry if that's a long answer to a short question but no it's a fabulous oh, answer it's very thank you you know thorough who did the artwork it's amazing the yeah thank you the, the artwork was done by a gentleman by the name of kevin conrad and kevin actually worked for todd mcfarlane who todd mcfarlane put out the kiss psycho circus comic book series and kevin did all the inking for all 31 issues of the Psycho Circus comic. And um, uh, it's a common misconception for that inkers that essentially what they do is they just trace what the pencilers do. It's really not. It's like what the pencilers usually provide is somewhat of a, a, a rough sketch of what the art, artwork is to be. And in some cases, you know, Kevin literally redrew some of the artwork that was pre presented to him that he needed to ink. And then, you know, that gets sent off now to colorization. It's all done digitally. Back in the days, people would actually, you know, that would be a, a, an actual artistic thing to do the coloring. Um, but now it's all digital. But, um, yeah, Kevin, you know, he was uh, really – you know, the finalist of, of how all the artwork looked for the Kiss uh, Psycho Circus comics. And, and uh, I was a big fan of his art. And Kevin actually did the cover to um, one of the Kiss Underground uh, issues that I did. So uh, Kevin and I have history going back to about 1998, I believe, is when he did the cover for the Kiss Underground. And so I knew when doing this album, the tricky thing was to do a, a Kiss-related album and to have Kiss on the cover but not show their faces. Because, right. you know, out of respect to Kiss, as much as I respect them, I respect their legal team. And, <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> yes, and, and I love you, Paul. Very, yeah, they're very, they're very adamant about you know. <laughs> Dear diary, they're very adamant about their protection of the Kiss logo and the makeup designs. So 
you know, it was uh, it was hard to come up with a um, a concept of you know how do I have Kiss on the cover without violating you know those uh, uh, you know their 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 trademarks. So you know, I always thought that the Kiss Destroyer album cover had one of the most iconic poses you know the kiss had ever done on you know any photo or album and i and i think that you know people would recognize that i i hope that they would recognize that and then once i seen kevin take my idea and actually you know translate that into just you know my concept and see it on paper and see it in it inked and then you know it was uh colored by a gentleman by the name of Ben Prenvost, uh, he did the colorization for it. You know, to see the final work, and it really just came to life. And the cool thing is, in the background, is actually um, the city hall of Buffalo, New York. And it's you know, being you know, uh, being a Kiss fan and being into comics and you know, superheroes and all that stuff. You know, going downtown, <clears throat> I always thought that um, it had a very Gotham esque type look to our downtown so to see the city hall um in comic book form it really brought that you know gotham-esque vibe to it so to have kiss and the destroyer poses uh you know from behind uh in front of city hall i just thought that was i just thought it turned out great no absolutely and where can the fans find it again I know Bandcamp, but if you want to just let everybody know where they can get a copy. Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing that I tell people is go to www.bufflorockcity.com. And because the Bandcamp, it's a longer URL and it's harder to remember. But if you go to bufflorockcity.com, that has all the information about the album, has the press release. And then you can just click on order. And when you click on order, that redirects you directly to Bandcamp. So that's really the easiest way to do it, is go to our website, and then you can order directly from Bandcamp. And the great thing about Bandcamp is that when you buy the CD online, you immediately get the digital download of the record. So that's you know the great thing. So while you're waiting to get the CD with all the liner notes and the great artwork and you know I, i'm still so old school when it comes to i like having physical product i i like you know you know i i guess i get it where people just want the music and they just want to have it downloaded to their phone or whatever listening device they use but i i like being able to to i guess touch what i own <laughs> no absolutely so, you know so, um, you know, and, and again, the, having the great artwork, being able to see that, and, you know, the, the booklet has all the notes as far as who plays exactly and what song, all that information, just like an old school record, you know. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, it's you, you can't beat it because you get both. You get the digital download, so you get that immediately, boom, you got that on whatever you want, and then, you know, within a week, you'll have the, you know, physical product in your hand. Yeah, which is awesome. And how do you feel like it was nice also that you got this done before the pandemic? How was your CD release party? Um, actually, it wasn't. It was actually done during the pandemic. Oh, okay. Was was yeah that and and that ironically really made a lot of this record feasible because most of the guys. Um, who, who guest starred on the record. The, I'm talking about the national guys, like the Talisman and Tommy Henriksen and, you know, Robbie Takehack, you know, all those guys. Uh, Bumblefoot, you know, Dean Castronovo, all those guys were in bands that were literally on tour or ready to go on tour when the pandemic hit. So if these guys would have been out on the road I wouldn't have been able to get them to play on the record because they would have been out touring. And who knows when those tours would have started or stopped or when they had breaks, if they would have been, you know, they might have, you know, just wanted to rest, and not do, you know, recording work during that time. So having the pandemic occur 
actually, in a lot of ways, facilitated these artists being able to have the time to contribute to the record. So that that was the the good thing. Um, you know, we did record the drum tracks initially in January, so that was actually done all pre-COVID. Um, and then when we started finishing the record, um, it was during the summer when they when they started lifting a lot of the uh, restrictions here in New York, and we actually um, did a lot of recording here in Grand Island, New York, at, at Gene Schmidt. Um, again, Gene's a fantastic guitar player. He plays on a number of the tracks. He's one of the co-producers of the record, and we did a lot of recording at his studio in Grand Island once the restrictions started to uh, get lifted. And um, you know, and then once um, we had everything done, everything was recorded. Um, it was actually mixed and mastered uh, in December, and um, and then you know. Shortly after December fifteenth, we put the record out. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Have you had a chance to look on the Carlino Guitars website? You know, I they come across my feed quite a bit, and I see that they um, make a lot of the custom guitar straps. Yes, for Gene and Paul. I also saw that they have a model of guitar that they're coming out with that looks very similar to the um i don't know if paul actually played the guitar for the dubai show but there was a a guitar that he was playing um in rehearsals for dubai that looked like a combination between a les paul and iceman and i seen that um carlino has um a model that looks similar to that um and uh, that's the most recent thing that I've seen from from their from their Facebook page. Yeah, Eddie sponsors the show. He always had the same sort of dream that you did. It ended up happening, which is awesome. Tell my listeners, you're living proof of it. Eddie is living proof of it. I'm living proof of it. That you put something in your mind, you make things happen. I can't wait to come to one of your shows, kiss this, and see my favorite ace which is you uh do oh, your thing you. <laughs> do you have a do you, does your guitar smoke at all it does smoke nice it, I, should say, I should say it smokes when it wants to <laughs> <laughs> well i think smoking is legal nowadays for whatever you try i have to talk to that guitar knock it off <laughs> <laughs> well john you're an inspiration thank you for your time thank you for sharing your experiences it's just amazing I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and, um, and, and I thank you for, you know, helping get the message out, you know, about the record to people, you know, I mean, there's so many people that are still learning about this record and the fact that it exists and, you know, the more people that I can, you know, let them know about the record and, and, and the cause. I mean, it's, it's, it's for, to me, it's, it's a win-win situation. If it is. Wanna, if you want to help some people, you know, especially, you know, like I said, you know, some, some, some kids, you know, that, that, are, that are really dealing with adversities, especially, you know, like you had mentioned in the beginning of the interview, how, how, you know, rough it is with the snow here in Buffalo. You know, we might as well have created the snow here. You know, it's, uh, winter is, is the worst time that I can imagine to be homeless. And um, for us to be able to try to, you know, help some kids, you know, during this, this really tough time, and, and at the same time providing a, a unique KISS tribute record that's never been done like this way that, you know, that we did it, and uh, to hear some songs that you don't get to hear very often, um, you know, I just I just think you know if you're a fan of of Kiss, if you're a fan of hard rock music, and and if you got a good heart, I, I think you know this record is is for all the above. Buffalo Rock City, baby! I'm jumping in the car and coming up to have a good time. <laughs> Let's do it! All right, have a great day, and we want to thank John Jeffrey, Buffalo Rock City. Amazing what he's done from his Kiss Underground magazine all the way up to his album, Buffalo Rock City. He's also in Kiss This, 
Kiss tribute band. He is ace in that. Wonderful to talk to. Good to get to know. And we want to thank you for listening to Melted. Brought to you by Carlino Guitars. Best guitars in the business. Thank you. And I want everyone to have a great day. Keep making your art. Get a chance. Buffalo Rock City. Check it out. And have a great day. podcast was produced in collaboration with the Boston Free Radio Podcast Network, part of bostonfreeradio.com and Somerville Media Center, Somerville's longest running public access media center that enables a vibrant and diverse community to express its creativity, explain its ideas, share its cultures, and foster the individual right to freedom of speech. Learn more about Somerville Media Center at somervillemedia.org or check out some of the other amazing Boston Free Radio podcasts and radio shows at bostonfreeradio.com. Thanks for listening.